what a great job in the selection of songs tonight. And boy, I enjoyed the announcements. When you can come to church and like the announcements, things are exciting. Amen? It was just really good. And uh, how many of you had a wonderful Christmas? How many folks had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas? How many of you got your family there? How many folks were able to go over to somebody else's house and open presents so you could slide in or slide out? How many folks were able to do that? You ought to double your time for that. God bless you. Amen. And uh, isn't it a great time to get together with family? It really is. And uh, we had scheduled stuff for a long time. And I knew I was going to be in another service on Sunday morning. I knew that about six months ago. And, uh, but the whole time I was here, I sent the staff, uh, uh, what, a text, I think it was, early Sunday morning. Well, I almost said email, sent a text out and told them, at the same time you were having church, I was sitting there thinking about, I wish I was here. And you had a big crowd, and God blessed you. Isn't it good to be in church? On Just think about it. And then this coming Sunday, the very first day, of a brand new year, we're able to be in church that Sunday morning. That's a big deal. And uh, we used to love to have a New Year's Eve service. Anybody ever been in a New Year's Eve service? And we used to have one start at 8 o'clock and go did every year. Went to midnight, and then after midnight, we went over. You don't know how long ago it was. Now I went to Shoney's. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And went over to Shoney's, and those places stayed open all night. <clears throat> and we get home 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? <clears throat> Look back on those, some of the best days we ever had. Amen. And uh, this is going to be an unbelievable weekend. Sunday morning, get everybody you can here. And then the following Thursday night, everything ties in from now to the end of the revival. On that Thursday night, <clears throat> what I'm going to do on that night, tremendous choir is going to sing and a great song. You're going to be blessed by just about 10 minutes of music. And what I'm going to do is talk about what the Scripture teaches and give you the function of a church, what a church is all about. What does it take for a church? A lot of people are members of church. They don't know what it's all about. So that, let me tell you who that's for Thursday night, week from tomorrow night. That's for everybody that's a member of Countryside Baptist Church. It's not just for people who are already on a team. It's for them, and there'll be tables to sign up and recruitment opportunities and this sort of thing. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to double the number of workers in this church? How about this one? How about if we get everybody as a worker to know what their function is? Would that be a good thing? How about if we get everybody that's already at work or committed to really set out to it? Would that be a good thing? It's just hard to get all those things done. But we're going to, that Thursday night, if you miss that Thursday night, you're going to hear about it and say, boy, that's the one time I should have been there. Because you'll walk away from there saying, I know why I'm a member of a church. I know what God wants of me. It's going to be exciting. So a lot of great things are happening. Now, I'm glad you're here. This is a tough time to get a good crowd to come. It's a good group here tonight, and I'm glad you're here. How many got your Bible? Open your Bible to Acts chapter 9, and you need to read several verses with you tonight. Wednesday night, the time of Bible study is kind of what it's going to be tonight. And tonight I want to talk about, you can look at the screen and see, we talked about the support team. The support team. You say, who are you talking about? I'll tell you about that in just a minute. The support team. And a lot of what we're going to deal with, the message this Sunday morning I've been praying over for about three months. And uh, I got up Friday night. Anybody ever wake up in the middle of the night, you can't, you, you're wide awake, everything's on your mind like that? I woke up Friday night, and I couldn't get things together in my mind for the message this Sunday morning. I, I knew it's kind of like here's the pasture and there's a horse and there's the barn, but how do you put it all together? I woke up about 2 o'clock on Friday morning, and all of a sudden I laid there, and it was just, and I got up, and June said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the other room, open my Bible up, get a pad, and write some things down before I forget it. And the rest of that message came together in the middle of the night, Friday night. And I've been praying over that for about three months over what's going to happen January 1st. And I want you just to make sure that you pray much for that. And uh, you say, well, are you building it up bigger than it is? No, I can't build it up big as it ought to be. And we need to be here. We need to get all of our members here. be honest with you, I, I kind of a little bit jealous of the fact that all the people that are down working in other areas won't be here for the message Sunday morning. How many folks know what I mean by that? I mean, we, there's a certain time when a family needs to get together and get some things done. That's the kind of service that's going to be this Sunday morning. So let's pray about it. All right, Acts chapter 9. We're going to read a couple of verses. Then I'm going to get up to the verses we want to deal with. And I want you to write some things in your Bible. Let's stand together. Can we do that? 
And I want to read a couple. I want to start in verse 1 of Acts chapter 9. And I'm going to read a few verses. Then we're going to have prayer and be seated. Then we're going to go forward a little bit. Here's the conversion of the Apostle Paul. What was his name before he got saved? He was Saul. So read with me. Let's begin in verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, that means anybody that believes Jesus, Son of God, Jesus was crucified for sin, Jesus had been resurrected, if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And I want to tell you, when they came to Jerusalem, what they did, they ran them through a mock trial, they'd lock them up, a lot of times they would martyr them. It was almost like terrorism, what they would do to Christians in that day. So Saul headed up the arresting, putting Christians in jail, killing them after they got slaughtered, the whole deal. Now to verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he found her the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And there's a lesson in that in the time you do anything to a believer, you're doing it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 5. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He was under conviction. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Rise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but they were seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. And they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days, not being able to see without sight, and neither did he eat or drink. And that was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Ananias didn't know all this had gone on. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, now read the rest of that verse with me. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord, which I hope is a response upon every one of our hearts tonight. Amen? Say it one more time. Behold, I am here, Lord. Now, Lord, I ask you tonight to touch our heart. Touch my heart, all of us together, that, God, we could hear from heaven tonight, that we'd learn some things about the Bible that would help us, God, to serve you better to honor you, to put you first in our life. And Lord, we thank you for all that you've done historically in order that we would have the privilege not only to be a citizen of this nation, but to have the heritage that we have with the, the Scripture, the Word of God, the church, and all that is taught us by our Savior. We pray that you'd fall in power in our midst in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Now we know from other studying of the Scripture that when Paul got saved, he, the same time he got saved, God called him to preach. He's the only person I've ever read about that the very moment he got saved, the first thing that happened, he was called to preach. You remember what he told when he was before the kings and before Agrippa. And he said, I got saved. He gave him this account where he met Jesus head on and fell down, Lord, what thou have me to do? And all of a sudden he knew then that the Lord was the Lord Jesus Christ and he accepted Christ, and he said, I'm going to send you out to preach, remember, and to restore. And he commissioned him, the Lord commissioned him to go preach the gospel. Then all of a sudden, I want to call your attention tonight to somebody else that was already in Damascus. I want to call your attention to verse 10 to the man named Ananias. And I'm going to call Ananias the support team. We normally don't. We want to talk about Saul. We want to talk about Paul. We want to talk about Peter. But... I want to tell you, it's the men like Ananias that got the job done. Now you say, preacher, what do you mean by the support team? Let me show you what I mean. How many of you in this room tonight, you're not a pastor or a preacher or an evangelist or what I'm going to call a full-time missionary? How many of you are not an active missionary, you're not a pastor, you're not an evangelist, would you stand up? The only people I want to remain seated Okay, every one of you standing, you are the support team. You're the, don't, don't be seated yet. Look, look at me. 
If you, without you, there'd be no missions program in this church. Now, anytime you want to say amen, you can say amen. I know you're kind of saying it about yourself, but it's okay. Without you, there'd be no missions program. Without you, there'd be no choir. Am I right here? Without you, <laughs> there'd be no building here. Without you, there'd be no youth ministry. Without you, the ministry of this church could not go forward. So about the time the devil climbs on your shoulders and tells you, you're not important, you need to tell the devil to look the other direction. He's trying to get in the way of God's work. Every saved person is a part of the support team. Now, I'm going to let you be seated in a minute, but look at this slide for a minute. It does not say the active support team. Maybe it would be good if it did. It just says the support team. And every one of us ought to be active. Now I can get an amen. Now be seated if you would, please. So here's this man, representative of you and of me and Brother Larry, all of us here tonight, named Ananias. And all of a sudden, I want to give you four things to write down about him, and I'm going to give them to you in groups of Scripture to show you what really happened. First of all, next to verses 10, 11, and 12, I want you to write down the word availability. One of the first things that we need to do if we're going to be used of God is to be available. To be part of the support team and not be available, what good does it do? Amen. We need to be available. Look at what happened, verse 10. And that was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, all he did is call his name. He didn't tell him what he was going to do. He didn't give him a commandment. All he said is, Ananias. And look at what Ananias said. Behold, I am here, Lord. That's a pretty good response, isn't it? Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight. How would you like to have a street here in town named Straight? If it's like the area I was raised in, the next one next to it would be called Cricket, wouldn't it? But here's a street called Straight. And inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of not just any Saul, but I want you to get the guy that Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And I seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Now think, Paul had been there three days. I'm sorry, at this point his name was Saul. Saul had been there for three days. He was blind. He hadn't eaten anything. I mean, he was, for all practical purposes, just there. And God touched his heart and said, I'm going to send a man to you named Ananias. So God comes to a member of the support team he said, I got a job I want you to do. Behold, I am here, Lord. <laughs> I got something I want you to do. All right? No problem, God. I'm here. The first thing I want you to notice in verses 10, 11, and 12 is that he was available. And I think that's the greatest thing that you and I can think about is dependability. The greatest ability is dependability. And somebody said, well, what kind of ability do you need in order to get something down? Dependability. I was one of my, one of my grandsons at Throughout the years, he's been a little rebellious, lives up in Roanoke, Virginia. I've been with him for the last couple of days or so, and we spent a lot of time together. He's graduated from high school this year, and he wanted to go off and spend some time together. And he looked at me, and he said, you know, I've been a little bit rebellious. And I thought to myself, you know, there's a little bit there. And he said, uh, he said, Papa, he said, I've decided to get my life together. He said, now you baptized me years ago. I know I was saved, but I want to get some things straight. I'm graduating now. And he said, uh, I'm, I'm going two years of college, and I think I can, I can get a scholarship for that two years, and I want to do this. And he talked, I want to start a business. And here's a kid got graduated from high school. I want to start a business. I'm thinking, good night. He's talking like a guy 30, 40 years old, wide open. And I want to get some people involved in this, and I want to get some things going on with this. He said, now, if I want to be a leader, what is the greatest ability I can have? I said, dependability. Dependability. You got to keep your word. Amen. You give your word, you keep your word. He said, Well, tell me what you what is what do you mean by dependability? I said, Well, for instance, if you tell somebody you're gonna be somewhere at a certain time, you need to be there early so when that time gets you, you're already there. You need to be dependable. You need to be on time. I said, in preparing things, I said, if you're gonna make a financial obligation, you need to keep your word. And make sure you meet your financial obligations. I said, if you can't, everybody has trouble once in a while. Call the person in advance and make arrangements. 
but never let an engagement, whether it's time, promise to work, or whatever else you do, you need to keep your word, you need to be dependable. So that's the first thing I think we see in this, this man, Ananias, his support team, he was dependable. And I want you to write that down, availability, one of the greatest things we can have. And this is the first response that always comes from commitment. Someone was always talking about how we're going to get everybody committed. One of the first response, really the first door of commitment is availability. Walking through the door of availability. That's when we get committed where we can do something for God. And that's what happened in his life. Things began to happen, and it was a wonderful sort of thing. But then all of a sudden, something else happened. When he said, Lord, I'm here, he said, I want you to go visit Saul. Saul of Tarsus. And I want you to look at his response. Look at verse 13 and 14 for just a minute, and write down the word, he had an apprehension about doing the will of God. He had a little bit of fear. See, God said, are you available? I'm available. And God said, here's what I want to do. And he said, whoa, God, <laughs> wait just a minute. Look at verse 13 and 14. And Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man and how much evil he has done to the saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Here's what Ananias was saying. He was saying, Lord, what do you want me to do, go to jail? I go visit this guy Saul. He's already persecuted Christians. God, don't you care anything about my life? He had some apprehension. Have you ever been apprehensive about doing the will of God? Very simply, it means I don't know if I can do it or not. <laughs> or I might have too many obstacles standing in the way. Or something might keep me from doing what God wants me to do. You know, Moses had that, didn't he? Moses said, it's my speech. Now, Moses, by the way, was a good speaker. He was fluent in speech. You can see that in the first 40 years of his life. Moses didn't have a problem with speech, but all of a sudden the job got so big, he began to think about maybe my gift's not as big as the job. Can I say this to you? God will always give you the gift that you need to accomplish the job. He always will. And God will always equip you to do the job. But very few things in our life, now think about this, see if this doesn't make sense. If you don't have some apprehension about what God's called you to do, if it doesn't look like it's a little bit impossible, then God's probably not in it. Because if it were not a little bit impossible, you'd say, I, I got it, God. I got it. Step over here. I don't need you. Have folks with me here a little bit. Tomorrow noon, Lord willing, I'll be downtown in Charlotte, and we've got five leaders coming in from different areas of the country, and we're trying to put together for the Witness Project, we're trying to take it up four times its size this next year. And the budget that we've set for it is just over the top. And the needs that we've got, I can stand here and tell you that I already know. Jennifer, I already know what I'm going to write on that card. I got, God's already told me what to write on my card. You don't even know what I'm talking about. You'll find out on Sunday morning. But I know right now this next year that we've got to get 300 more churches on board in order to accomplish what we need to do and open the countries up and get the gospel to as many people as we need to. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't know how in the world we're going to get 300 churches. That's a pretty big job. Wouldn't you think it's a pretty big job? So I've got four guys coming plus two more, and them together have contacts and influence at over 1,000 churches. That's a good place to start, amen? Now I've got to recruit them. I've got to give them the vision. I got, are we on the same page a little bit? I've got a lot of apprehension about doing it. I know what God wants me to do. I know the doors God's open. I know the opportunity. I'd like to go to Kenya. Maybe some, one of you ought to go with us to Kenya. It's going to be an unbelievable time. Open up that whole Islamic side of Africa. We're bringing in, I just found out last week, we're bringing in 10 leaders from different parts of Africa so they can be in the conference where we're training 500 national pastors in Kenya so they can get on board with what we do so we can branch out and send 10 people into those areas and hit 500 in each one of those areas. In other words, we can do this kind of thing because we got a God that's big enough to do it. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And then it's something else that we got to do. Why in the world don't you want to invest yourself in something bigger than you are? I mean, why do you want to do something smaller than you are? And most of the time, what's going to happen, God's going to give you something bigger than you are. 
And that's what he did to Ananias. He said, Ananias, I know you're not used to this, but we've got the greatest persecutor of Christians around. We got a guy that's college trained that can speak several languages. He can get on the debate stage and he can out debate you. We got a guy coming that's locked people up, had the lives taken for them. We got a guy that went and had enough legal experience to get the synagogues together and get a letter to come to Damascus and lock up anybody want to, men and women, husband and wife, get them off the scene. We don't want any Christians. We don't want to get rid of them. Sound like what's going on today, doesn't it? It really does. And all of a sudden, Ananias said, I don't want any part of that. I can understand that. Can you understand? He said, man, this guy here, by the time I go up to him. So he had apprehension. Don't be afraid of having apprehension. As a, as a life uh, group leader, you're going to have apprehension of doing a great job. As a soul winner, some of you have never won a soul to Christ, and you've got a little bit of fear of doing it. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes you just have to jump in the water and let God teach you to swim. Amen? You get all the training you need, and all of a sudden you just jump in the water. And that's an important thing to do. As a servant of God, somebody, I speak to pastors a lot of time, and let me tell you, a lot of preachers feel the same way all of us feel a lot of time, which is, I am not sufficient for the task. And I had a guy told me that about uh, six weeks ago. I was talking to him about what he's going to do in his church. He said, well, I'm going to be honest. I passed through this church in God's blessing, but I'm not sufficient. I said, I know, I know you're not. And I shocked him. <laughs> and he looked at me kind of funny. He said, well, what do you mean? Like, I was supposed to tell him he was sufficient. <laughs> And I said, you're not sufficient, I'm not sufficient, Earl's not sufficient, Larry's not sufficient, but I'll tell you what we can, we got a God that's sufficient. Amen? Yeah. And God takes the undesirable, the untrained, the unlovely, the unpolished, and God brings glory to himself. Amen? Yeah. By using them. So don't be afraid of being apprehensive. When you get a little apprehension, see, verses 10, 11, and 12 give you the availability that's the starting point. That's the door. God, I'm available. Then when God tells you what he wants you to do, most of the time it's bigger than you are. Most of the time it's more powerful than you are. Starts out that way with tithing. Starts out that way with sowing. It starts out that way everything we do for God. Marriage starts out that way, by the way. Could I get an amen? <laughs> you look at it and say, whoa, <laughs> what's going on here a little bit? And you get in the middle of it and go forward. Then you have children. How many of your life got changed when you started having children? You got a child to change your life, doesn't it? Amen. And that's a good thing. It changed your life. And, you, and God grows us. Don't worry about it. When you got apprehension, God can take care of it. When you got fear, God can take care of it. When you got limitations, God can take care of it. Now let's move to the next verse if we can, because I like this. Put the word affirmation next to verses 15 and 16. What does affirmation mean? It means God comes back in and says, let me answer your fear. Let me prove myself worthy. Now, look at verse 15. Let's start at verse 15. Remember 13 and 14, God? <laughs> this guy's a killer of Christians. I'm apprehensive about this thing. The Bible said in verse 15, but the Lord said unto him, wow. We need to hear from God, don't we? We need to hear from God. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, God did not owe him an explanation, did he? I mean, if he said, Ananias, go down there. And Ananias said, God, whoa, that guy's going to kill Christians. I'm, I'm going to be the next. God could have said, I told you to go, go. He didn't do that. He gave him some information. Can I tell you, you've got a wonderful God and a God that will help you to understand what he wants you to do. He didn't have to give him an explanation, but he gave him a full explanation of what was happening. But I think one of the key phrases in verse 15, but the Lord said unto him. Now, how does God give you affirmation? How does God, when you, you've got fear of serving God, or you say, I can't make it on my job, or I can't make it in my home, or I need to give up on this, or I, I can't get the job done. As you look at that word, support team, you know, what's going to take us to the next level? Where do we get what we need from God? Number one, you get it from the Bible. You get it from the Bible. Read the Bible. I cannot tell you how much you need to read the Bible. Amen? Get the Bible off the page into you. <laughs> and you read it. Somebody said, well, I don't understand it all. Don't worry about it. Just obey what you do understand. 
That's enough problem right there. Amen? Just obey what you do understand. God will give you some understanding of the other later on. And so don't worry about what you don't know. Just obey what you do know. <laughs> and so we need to read the Bible. We need to read the Bible every day. How many of you have ever made a commitment to God that you read the Bible all the way through a year, in a year? How many folks have ever done that? I have. I'm not going to ask you how many of you. Yeah, no, nah, I'm not going to ask you, but I'll raise my hand. Don't raise your hand. How many of you have ever made a commitment you read the Bible all the way through, but you missed a couple of days and had to catch up? I have. You don't have to raise, no, you don't have to raise your hand. I'm just raising mine to tell you. I want to tell you it's tough to stay right on track every day. I have finished a very intensive study of the book of Hebrews, the best study I've ever had. Uh, got our family together. And this is interesting because this happened on Christmas afternoon. Our whole family is together. And I already told them I want to read the Christmas story. And so you had the Christmas story read here. You know where I read the Christmas story? Hebrews chapter 1. The Christmas story? God, in sundry times, different matters, spoke to people this way. Verse 2, now he has spoken through his son. His son who is the creator. And I took my time going through there and gave an invitation and had two family members saved on Sunday afternoon. Amen. Amen. That's a pretty good Christmas, isn't it? You say, do you give an invitation? I give an invitation every time I do anything. I really do. If I have a, a wedding, I give an invitation. My son, John, my youngest son was here. John, he married an Episcopalian girl. When he met her, she was Episcopalian. She came and heard me preach, got saved in a meeting. And that girl's a sweet girl on fire for God. Her parents are Episcopalian. He told me, told me when he got married, he said, Dad, he said, we both decided we want you to conduct that wedding. But we know her parents want it in an Episcopalian church. So, but we're not going to Episcopalian church. I said, yes, you are too. Her parents are going to pay for it. And look at the lost people that will be there. He looked at me. He said, that's all you think about, isn't it? And I said, most of the time. And they had to get special permission for me to go to Episcopalian church. It took the rector over the state of Michigan to give me permission to go in that Episcopalian church and stand behind that rostrum. It was funny to me. And the priest came up. I had the privilege separately from that to lead the pastor. They called him the priest of the Episcopalian church to lead him to Christ. But 32 people in that wedding ceremony lifted their hand when I told them marriage was the greatest example of a relationship to Jesus Christ. And this is how you become a Christian. It don't take long to give the gospel out. You know how many people got offended? How many of you think got offended there? None. Not a one. How many of you think will come around afterwards a lot of questions, bunches? Interesting. I'm just telling you, don't miss an opportunity to give the gospel out. Amen? It's a wonderful thing. So where are you going to get your faith? Where are you going to get your, for God to come in and affirm that he has put you to the task? You're going to get it from the word of God. You get it firsthand when you get it from the word of God. Let me give you another place you get it. You get it at church. We need to be at church every time the doors open. I'm preaching to the choir to say this, but <laughs> Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Every night of revival, we need to be at church. And we need to have our children there. We need to have our grandchildren there. If you've got grandchildren within 50 miles of here, I'd have them in here Monday night, Tuesday night, if you possibly can get them. It'd be worth your effort for them to be here in this revival meeting. Amen? Amen. And it'd be a whole lot cheaper than one of them getting cocked out sideways and you have to pay to send them to some camp somewhere to straighten their life out later on and get them off for something when they can get their life straight with God in the beginning. Wouldn't that be a whole lot better? So we need to get our children, our grandchildren. We need to be in church. I'm in different conferences. Once in a while, the preachers say, you know, I'm thinking about dropping this service and dropping Wednesday night and dropping this. I said, why is that? Well, people are so busy today. I said, what's the Bible say? Uh, does the Bible say anything about how many times you go to church? I said, well, not in number, but it gives you instruction. They said, where is that? I said, in Hebrews. The Bible says, forsake, say it with me, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the custom of some. What's the end of that verse say? You ever memorize the end of that verse? And so much more the so as the day approaches. You know what that means? That means if in 1900 you needed to go to church three times a week, stay right with God, today you need to go five times a week. So much more the so as you look to Jesus to come back. 
People need to be in church more today than they ever needed before. Amen? I don't just mean for the dullness of it or just to say we got a ritual. I'm talking about we need fellowship. I need to hang around good people. You need to hang around good people. How many of you enjoy coming to church just for the energy of walking in and get somebody to smile at you? You go to work, somebody cusses you out. You go to work, and somebody talks about how you don't lose a job. <laughs> You're riding down the road and minding your own business. Somebody uh, gives you some kind of sign or something going down. I mean, every time you turn around, you out in this world and people are doing this and doing that to you and everything. You walk in church and somebody just look at you and smile and say, God bless you, brother, I love you. They can hug each other and, you know, shake each other's hands. And one of the things that ought to be present in coming to church is energy. What the energy? That's the reason I like the way Brother Larry Lee's singing. Man, get up here and get her done. I mean, just crank it up. Amen? And that's the way it ought to be. We ought to enjoy being in church. And church affirms to us what God wants us to do. I don't know how many times I have been, and I mean most places I go, I preach. But I'll be honest, I, I get, I'm not talking about the preach, I'm not just being around people in the music. A lot of times when I go preach at different meetings and conferences, I do what I did tonight. I sit on the front row, I don't even sit, I like to sit on the front row and be part of what's happening out there, just pick it up. Because it does something to me. Kind of climbs in your soul a little bit, gets you excited. It really does. They used to have this one hour in a can. What was it called? One hour, what's it called? You drink it one hour, whatever, pep or one hour shot or what's got caffeine in it? And now it's five hour. Yeah, they got a five hour. They keep pumping at it. They'll do what church will do to you. They're trying to get it up to where they can say you can get it out of a can. You get more at church than you do in a five hour can shot. Amen. <laughs> I don't know what to call it, but I know what it does to you to come to church. It's just a joy to come to church. Amen? Joy to be here. I mean, to smile. Where in the world can I get a smile like that right there? But at church. Isn't that great? It really is. And, you know, somebody pats you on the back and look at you and say, you're doing a great job. Spend your time building people up. It's a great thing to come to church. Now, where do we get affirmation? We get it from the Scripture. Answers to everything you need are in the Word of God. We get it from church. Now, let me tell you who else we get it from. We get it from people that are our mentors and our trainers. Every one of you ought to have people that you kind of look up to that are mentors and trainers. When I first, young preacher, 27 years old, I started first church I started, early 20s. <laughs> Brother Arnold, it was hard to believe this, but I thought I knew everything. I really did. It didn't take me long to find out I didn't know much of nothing. And some issue would come up, and I'd say, somebody said, what do you believe about that? I didn't even know anything about it. Some doctrinal issue. And I'd look what John R. Rice said. And I decided, man, whatever John R. Rice says, he's close to God. He's been at this thing 60 years. He's written about 60, 70 books. I've heard him preach in conference. I hear him every year in a conference preach. He walks with God. He gets his prayer answered. Anybody can tell a lady in the congregation, if you haven't been able to have a baby, come up here and I'm going to anoint you. And next thing you know, that woman is pregnant and has a child. A guy can pray like that. I want to listen to what he's got to say. Amen? And I mean, that guy's walking with God. Haven't you heard of John R. Rice? You ought to get his books when he's rich. I'm telling you, I was very fortunate to have him as a mentor for 11 years of my life. 11 years. And I didn't go by a year that I didn't get around him. Jerry Falwell, twice a year, for over 20 years, I made sure I had breakfast with him twice a year. I could keep going with different names of people. Lee Robinson, once a month I had a meal with Lee Robinson and reviewed everything I was doing, wanting him to tell me what I could do different and do better at, and things like that. We need mentors, and you need people that look at you and say, you could do a better job if you do it this way. Now, you don't have to take his advice, but I, want to, I don't like yes people. Now, I don't want a no person because they're obstinate, they're not right with God and rebelling against God. I, I'm not interested in that crowd. But I want people, not necessarily yes people, but people that are thinkers, that are walking with God and said, here's an alternative we can pray about. Amen? Here's something we can consider. And that's what puts a team together. A team is not one guy and get everybody to do it. A team is us. It's we. That's a very important thing. It's not me. It's we. Amen? So that's the person you can get affirmation from. Every one of us in here ought to have people that we can hang around that lift us up, people that we can get around that will give us advice. And you ought to have people you can go to and listen to them, watch what they do. I used to, as a young preacher years ago, every month 
I would choose a different preacher and study his style of preaching. I remember Jack Kyle started preaching. Anybody ever heard Jack Kyle's preach? Jack Kyle started preaching. And I'm going to tell you what he is. Jack Kyle's is what you call a communicator. And he could get just one thing and just communicate that thing. And I took apart. I studied, I must have studied over 200 of his messages. On the way home to home tonight, I'll go on YouTube and listen to one of Lee Robinson's messages and one of Jack Howell's messages. I've already planned to do it. I know which one I'm going to listen to. So why do you do that? So I can run about 80 or 90 miles an hour and feel good while I'm doing it. Amen. <laughs> no, I want to do it so I can, what? Get my heart and my spirit challenged. Because I know one thing, if I listen to the devil, I'm not going to be able to accomplish what I need to. I don't know how much longer I'm going to live. How much longer are you going to live? Somebody asked me, I don't know how to answer this. I, 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 want to, I know how I want to answer, but I don't want to. So how much longer are you, going, you, know, you going to keep at it? How much longer are you going to serve the Lord? I want to say about a, a couple months longer than you are. That's what I want to say, but I don't want to say it. sound like a smart aleck. And I am a smart aleck by nature, so I try not to say things like that so people won't know what I really am. So I, I think I'm in a hole right here. I'm not real sure. Are we together here a little bit tonight? But what I want, I know me. If I don't listen to some people who've done some exploits and tried to get some exploits done from God, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to settle for a little bit less than my best. And God wants our best. Amen? God wants to do our best. So I don't know, 2017, it may not get here, the rapture may come. But if it does get here, let's give God a year and crank it up till Jesus comes back. Amen? Let's give him all we got. So there's apprehension. Now i got one more word for you. There's availability, verses 10, 11, and 12. Then there's apprehension on the part of Ananias, verses 13 and 14. Then God affirms or reaffirms, gives him affirmation, verses 15 and 16. And then verses 17 through 20 is that wonderful word, acceptance. It's when the spirit is quieted. It's when everything is okay and you know God's in control and you accept the will of God for your life. Look at what happened. Verse 17, and an Ananias went his way. Can't you see him whistling, walking around, whistling, just walking down the road, you know, whistling amazing grace. He thought he's going to jail, and now he thinks everything's in God's hand. And he entered into the house, and he put his hands on him. And what did he call him? Look at that verse and tell me what he called him. If God had not touched his heart, no way in the world he would have called him that. What did he call him? Brother Saul, whoa, <laughs> I mean, this known persecutor of Christian, this guy that put women and men both in jail, they would see that their lives were taken, that was disrupted the greatest agitator to Christianity in the Roman Empire at that time was Saul. And all of a sudden, because God had reaffirmed to him his position in him, he walks in and says, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest has sent me. That's something we ought to understand. God sends us. We go to places. I read Brother Earl's reports of these hospital rooms, different people to go, and God sent him there. He's going as a representative. And you say, well, that's good for Earl. What about you? You're going as a representative every time you're going to pay for your gas. Amen? We are representatives. We are ambassadors for Christ. He has sent me that thou mayest receive thy sight. Look at the faith he had. You're going to get your sight back and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately thou fell from his eyes, from Saul's eyes, as it has been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. How would you like to have been at that baptismal service? And he was baptized. So here is an everyday layman that's only mentioned this one time in the Bible that we know he's part of the support team. He's responsible, listen, for discipling one of the greatest preachers to ever walk on this earth, Paul himself. He started the discipleship procedure. He is responsible for getting him baptized after he got saved. He's responsible for God touching his body physically and removing the scales so he could see and he could go forth and serve God. So God had a great task for him to do. Amen. Now, somebody could look and said, he's not very important. I want to tell you, in God's economy, it's like Brother Larry said earlier, there's no littles and bigs. We're all the same. God had a great job for him to do. God's got a great job for you to do. And the Bible said in verse 19, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. 
Then were Saul certain days with the disciples that were Damascus, and straightway he did what God had saved him and told him to do. Straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the way God wants to use us. But it starts by us saying, Lord, look back at verse 10. What are the words? Behold, I am here, Lord. Will you say those five words with me tonight? Behold, I am here, Lord. Let's stand, can we? Let's bow our heads for just a minute. And I'm going to close in prayer in just a second, but I want you to take a second now and just talk to God. Just tell God that, God, I'm available. He'll know what you mean. Just say, God, I'm available. Say, behold, I am here, Lord. I'm available. What have you had me to do, God? I'm not going to call it big. I'm not going to call it little. I'm not going to, it's not up to me, God. It's up to you. I'm your servant. God, if it's just to hold the door open, I'm satisfied. If it's just to sweep the floor, I'm satisfied. If it's to be used in another capacity, I'm satisfied. But God, I'll wait on you. And I know that when you give me something to do, it may be bigger than I am. But that will only let me grow. And you're going to give me full assurance I can accomplish it. What a joy it is to serve God. Now, Father, thank you for the privilege of being in church tonight. Thank you for these good people. God, thank you for families, for individuals. Thank you for our hearts that you've touched tonight. And God, we confess that, God, we're but sinners saved by grace. And what a joy it is to serve you. Dismiss us with your power and your glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.